Hi, Father Ian Van Heusen here. So what I want to do in this fourth Sunday of Lent is I kind of want to walk through the reading line by line, maybe not giving chunks of lines as well, and kind of reflecting on it's a pattern that moves us when we go from falling into sin and then being reconciled with the Father. So we're going to walk through the gospel with that in mind. So it's the parable of the prodigal son. And the first line, or actually a little bit in, because I skipped a little bit. A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate, that it should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. So the first dynamic, when the son separates his wealth from the father, I would say this is a metaphor for our pride. Lord, I don't need you in my life anymore. I, you know, I have what I need. So there's a sense that we turn in on ourselves first. We, we, we start to do things apart from God. Now, it doesn't mean we have to think about God all the time, but we can examine our hearts and we can see those moments where we start to pull away from spiritual practices, where we start to pull away from that ongoing discernment and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? So that's the first step. We turn in on ourselves. We have pride. Then after a few days, this younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country. So when we turn in ourselves and we have that pride, then what we maybe start to do is we start to maybe take unnecessary risks. We put ourselves in the near occasion of sin because we're not mindful of God and we're not worried about falling into mortal sin or falling away from the Father. Some of those circumstances around us start to shift and soon we're falling into sin or soon we're far from the Lord. And, and that's what we're going to continue to meditate on. So there he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he found himself in dire need. I think it's a fascinating dynamic. I see it a lot. Now, not with everybody. With lucky people, this is what happens. With the good people, lucky people, I shouldn't say lucky. We don't believe in luck, right, Tim? So, I mean, with people that the Lord's doing powerful things in, what's a good thing that happens is that desire for sin dries up. The thrill of sin, the excitement, the pleasure associated with it slowly dries up. It becomes tedious. It becomes boring. That's what I would say looking at this seeing it as a spiritual metaphor for that dryness which starts to set in when we're filling our hearts with sin and it starts to just not feel good. It just doesn't, it doesn't have the same thrill. You know, I think also we could look at Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes, where it says vanity of vanities. So maybe even if it's not big dramatic sin, but the things of this world will eventually fade. And when that starts to do, it's like a famine where our desires dry up. So, the, the prodigal son hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here I am dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would one of your hired workers. So I think we also need to recognize, in this part, we see true contrition in the Son. One dynamic that is often the case with folks who are struggling, sometimes people don't have contrition. They don't like the negative consequences of sin or the negative consequences of bad decisions. But really what they want is they want the consequences to go away. They don't recognize that they've fallen short. They don't recognize the sin within. They're not willing to look at themselves and say, I'm in a bad situation. I need to go back to God. I need to turn to the Father. The prodigal son, in contrast, he recognizes his situation. He turns back to the Father. He has true contrition, a humble heart. You know, sometimes people seek religion and they seek God because they want good things. Or they, they, want, they don't have that true understanding of penitent where they recognize their complete dependence and the need for God's mercy and His gentleness in their life. But we want to be the opposite of that. We want to lower ourselves constantly when we start to fall into sin. And by the way, this can be not so dramatic. Maybe it's even a cycle that we all go through that when we fall in daily sins or we... For, become forgetful or drowsy of the spiritual things. We fall in this way and then we have to come before our Lord with humility. So he got up, went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. He said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. 
Put a, finger on, a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. So, our Lord comes to us. We humble ourselves in lowly. Our Lord comes, he raises us up. So when we humble ourselves and say, Lord, I'm not worthy of you, our Lord says in reply to that humble, penitent heart, he says, you are worthy of love. Come, my beloved one, the one who I want to give my heart to. He raises us by degrees until we participate in his contemplation. The wedding feast of the Lamb, the divine liturgy, wells up within our hearts. But this is not something we do on our own. In fact, we must prepare for it. That is why that need for humility. We don't reach the heights of holiness by our own efforts, but rather the Lord comes to us and raises us in degrees and stages, opening a door in our heart one moment at a time. So the last part is we have the story of the older son. I'm not going to get into it and read the whole thing, but you can read it in this spiritual exercise. And at first it seems like, well, this is a good place to end, right? So we have the wedding feast. Um, we have the celebration, the wedding feast of the Lamb. I mean, that's not what the reading says, but, you know, kind of reading it spiritually. What does the older brother have to do with this? Well, there is this interesting dynamic that we always have to recognize, even within the church. And I believe the older brother points, this, points to this, which is even when we're reconciled, when we're raised up, there will often be forces that try to work against us. There will be negative forces. There will be criticisms. There will be things within the church. There's always this sense of imperfection on this side of eternity and always wanting to wrestle with that. So we're going to have people who are going to oppose us, people who are going to criticize us. Are we able to maintain that joyful disposition and to persevere or are we scandalized? And recognizing that ultimately true perfection is found only through Jesus Christ. And while we still exist in this world, we're always on the way, a project of ongoing conversion. So consider that today. You can go back through the, and read, those, the, read the gospel as a spiritual exercise, seeing in it the own di your own dynamics, the dynamics of your heart. Amen.